you to introduce Jamie and take it away. Excellent. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank you, Quentin Sensei, for uh, hey. your quick and total yes in uh, having <laughs> having Kathy today. She's really a very, very special guest, an amazing human being. Um, thank you, too, for suggesting I take the lead here. Uh, <clears throat> hope I'll do half as good a job as you do. You do a great job. I'm sure you will. So to introduce Kathy Sensei, I got all prepared because there's so much to, um, to say about Kathy. Uh, <clears throat> so by way of introduction, I am not sure if I love her more dearly or respect her more deeply. She is a totally uh, spiritual human woman and she's a great Aikidoist. Check out her work. She's a magnificent painter, her paintings, drawings. She's a great sculptor. She is a sort of uke nage equestrian, which has been very interesting, passionate teacher. And she's a fierce activist and always a story and truth teller out to change herself and our very, very messed up world, out of balance world. She loves to deconstruct the dictates of normal of normalcy. She wrote in her book, uh, normalcy isn't all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> so she's uh, a very strong advocate for authenticity. And as you will hear along the way, she tells it like it is. She's a self-avowed and very happy Ronin. <laughs> uh, so we, you know, too bad she wasn't in our Aikido and politics conversations. She started training in 1977, I believe at Tam Dojo, Tam Pius Dojo in Mill Valley. And I'm not sure if we first met pairing up on the mat or uh, through Lomi School where we both got our first training in body work, somatic psychology and conscious movement. We were lucky to share in those very rich heydays of the Bay Area Aikido, so the 70s and 80s. And in 1989, Kathy said a big yes to me uh, to join a, our very <clears throat> sort of awesome, open-hearted, open-minded uh, troubadour group that I led to introduce Aikido, help introduce Aikido to the, to the Soviet Union at the time. So, so much has happened since then in her Aikido, her teaching, her partnership with her husband, who I don't know how she found. He's so wonderful. He's, he's not only is he sweet and smart, he's a terrific Aikidoist and a great artist as well. They just completely share life. Um, let's see. And then of course, recently her very unexpected encounter with sensei glioblastoma and journey through brain cancer. So that's just by way of introduction, so much we could talk about. So I wanna welcome you, Kathy Sensei. Thank you for being thanks. here. Thanks, I love Jane. you so much. Yeah, well, thanks for taking the time to talk to everyone today. For, for starters, would you share a little bit about your background, like where you grew up? Um, I know you were a tomboy. Were you always an artist, a rebel? <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get to Aikido? Stuff like that. Jimmy has an eye for the tomboys, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I grew up outside of Washington, D.C. Um, I, I, I think what's, what I, what's coming up to say is that my um, immediate family was very marked by um, disabilities. Um, my father brought polio home from World War II in the South Pacific. That affected his upper body. My younger sister was born with a birth defect, spina bifida. That affected the lower part of her body. Um, so it was not entirely welcome when my own eye problem, vision problem showed up. Because I was supposed to be the healthy normal one and I kind of screwed that one. Um, so that it's been an interesting ride with just within my family to, um, to realize that normal is not what we are and never were and, and are never gonna be. <laughs> and it's taken me years to find the freedom in that. There's a lot of freedom in just declaring yourself not normal. Screw it. Um, all of a sudden, uh, you don't have to fit in. Um, and, and you get to question what you're fitting into and whether it's viable. And, and, and it's not, it's not. It, as Bruce Coburn, the Canadian singer songwriter says, the trouble with normal is it always gets worse. So leave it behind. Um, so that's, anyway, I, I think that's the, the unexpected gift um, from growing up with a, a challenged, physically challenged family. Um, and it got me in the habit of looking for the gift, um, even when hard stuff happens to you, it got me in that habit. Um, what else, I've, I've been an well, artist. 
Yeah. That habit is artist, obviously artist, serving you well today, which we'll get into. Yeah, yeah. Been an artist my whole life. My, I was lucky to have my family support that. Um, they had a context for it because I have kind of a famous uncle, um, David Park, who was big in the Bay Area uh, figurative painting movement back in the 50s and 60s. You can look him up. He's, he's, he was one of the big boys, David Park. So um, that didn't get squelched, my artistic tendencies. They got encouraged. Um, my love for horses got encouraged, I think because my family needed to get rid of me um, during the summers because my younger sister was going through all these corrective surgeries for her spina bifida. And so again, you know, difficult circumstances ended up being a good thing for me. Um, I was definitely a black sheep as far as college went. Um, I tell my students, or I used to on campus that I majored in drugs and, um, and they would say, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I dropped out for 33 years and just pursued my art career and Aikido. So I'm sort of an autodidact that way. I, it made a lot more sense to educate myself in the way that felt right to me. But then I started to get tired of being poor. So I actually went back to college um, at age 53. And um, I, I thought I was gonna be a chiropractor because the Lomi school that Jamie mentioned, I have pretty good hands made my living for a while as a massage therapist, thought I'd be a chiropractor and then that all fell to hell. So, um, I, but I stayed in college and I, and I asked myself, what do I wanna do? It turns out I wanted to take creative writing and I wanted to take theater and I wanted to take more art classes. So I ended up graduating um, and going on to graduate school and getting a, um, master, a MFA in creative writing. So that's, I now teach, um, not on campus anymore, thank goodness. I teach through Adam State University in Alamosa, Colorado, which has the kind of unheard of distinction of being the premier print-based correspondence course deliverer to incarcerated students. All of my students are in jail across the nation and they're pursuing mostly business degrees, which makes sense, but they have to take English classes and I'm the one. So, so interesting. Um, I sneak in Aikido whenever I can. It, could you sneak um, in here? Uh, out of my order of my questions, but would you sneak in here your work in prisons years ago uh, with women, yes. incarcerated women? Yes. Doing, doing Aikido. Yes. Yes. In the 19, early 90s, um, I was asked by um, a, a, a woman on the mat at uh, Tamil Pius Dojo uh, if I would come in and tr teach a couple stress management groups to incarcerated women at FCI Dublin, which is East Oakland. And to be honest, the term stress management kind of makes me want to go. Um, because it's just bureaucrat tease. It's just, yeah, anyway, but it's okay because I figured out how to bring in holistic health and Aikido principles disguised, of course. Um, you can't just say, I'm going to teach prisoners Aikido. No, 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 no. You won't get in the door that way. But moving meditation? Oh, sure. You know, in, their, in the administrative mind of the prisons, that's a passive security device. Yeah, we're all for that. Anger management, you bet. Um, mm. Somatic work, meditation, yoga, anything. Um, anyway, that went on for four years. It was amazing. It was all volunteer run. I kind of got a couple grants to fund it. Um, the anecdotal evidence for how effective holistic health is within a prison setting was off the charts. But 
you know how politics, the political pendulum swings back and forth. And I forget who it was in California at the time, ran on the um, ticket of three strikes and you're out. Who was that? I can't remember. Um, and so anyway, it got shut down the program, but it kind of gave me, I never would have thought I'd bring who I am. Or it, it, I should back up. I start going too fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I brought in holistic health. I brought in art teachers. I brought in a theater person um, who the prisoners called the screaming lady um, who got them to vocalize. Um, I brought in musicians. I brought in some famous people, Clarissa Pinkola Estes. I brought her in to do storytelling. Um, some singers, some Bay Area singers that you might have remembered, Rhiannon. Mm. Um, yeah, the whole bunch. I just started to beat the drum around the Bay Area, which is so rich with creative people. And I basically challenged them to walk their talk. Okay, you're all for peace and justice and equality and expressiveness, okay, we're meeting at the prison. Bring your ID. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, and, and low me people too. So it was really cool while it lasted, but um, it got I remember I got out there a couple times. I mean, so transformative and enlivening and connecting and, um, you know, it's not what you think of as being offered in prisons. No. No. Do you get any post-prison stories from people who had benefited from that? Yes. Yes, I do. Sure. Okay. There is a woman in my stress management group and, they, and in my advanced one, which meant these were prisoners who had been incarcerated for 20 years and were looking at about 20 more years. She was from Thailand or the Philippines. I can't remember which. And we resonated because we had martial arts in common. She was a kickboxer and I had Aikido. And so we had sort of a frame of reference for being part of a lineage, for um, having a teacher, for practice, for how it, it's about polishing yourself. She came to me one day and she said, Kathy, I'm in trouble. I am in trouble. I, I was waiting in line and this bitch cut in front of me and a little sidebar waiting in line is really hard in prison because you just have to do it over and over and without without reason and you know and so if you if you've lost control of your of your of your cool button if you can't find your chill button and and it'd be an easy place to lose it so someone cut in line got in front of her and this woman, I'll call her Sadie. I don't know what her name was, but she said she almost went at this woman. She almost did. And then, and but she caught herself. And but she got the shakes afterward. And she went, she knew I was teaching the group and she went and found me. And she said, Kathy, oh my God, my father, I could see his face. He was so disappointed. I almost blew it. I almost blew the code. I know I'm not, you know, you, you can imagine if it had happened to yourself. And I listened and I listened because that was really the best skill that I, I, that I had was to listen and not judge. And then I waited and I waited and then all of a sudden I said something which stunned us both. I said, Sadie, you need to wrap a black belt around the woman who cut in line. She went, what? What are you talking about? She's a bitch, blah, blah, blah. You know, I said, no, she is teaching you something about your self-mastery, about your level of self-control. She taught you something really, really important. And you need to wrap a black belt around her and bow into the lesson. Not about her. I'm not saying she deserves the black belt. It's about how it changes you to wrap the black belt around. And it, anyway, it gave her some peace. She walked away. She came back later and she says, whoa, that was, that was heavy. I thought, you, <laughs> I thought you were nuts, but you were right. And um, 
I won't ever have that problem again. I'll have other problems, but I won't have that problem. Can, can I use this to, to segue? Um, I know you did some karate training before Aikido that, and then you got to Aikido. And I wanna ask you, the segue here is around centering. Um, for those of you who don't have her book, you should get it. Uh-oh, can't see it in my background here. Anyways, I'll show you later. Aikido off the mat. But uh, I was kind of going back through some things. And I so love how you talked about center. Um, that Here you are in Aikido and the, the male sensei saying, you know, go in your, your lower belly. And you're like, oh my God, that's like not just my lower belly. That's like down there. <laughs> you know, it's in my hips. It's in my uh, you know, my womb, and you wrote about is the incubation chamber, the literal seedbed of creative and regenerative power. And, you know, you weren't so sure you wanted to go like down there. And a, a man's not really thinking about that so much, right? And, you know, like monthly cramps and you know, the whole bit. Yeah. Um, and wide hips. Do you love your body? So much about the bodies coming up. Um, but also then connecting there and going, this isn't just lower belly. This is like women's power. This is our, um, you know, like waking us up to a, our power to, to change this um, effed up world. Yeah. So anyways, if you would talk about centering and, you know, what that means to you and, and how you, how you work with that with, you know, with your students, with yourself. Yeah. I, it, my center, when I first started, um, was probably up here in my chest. Um, that's probably probably where I live the most. It was like like Jamie saying that hole down there in my hips and my pelvis was loaded for me, as it is for many women. And and I'd love it if the men would speak to this too. But um, I, it's been a long time since I've had a male body. Maybe in another lifetime, but I know in this lifetime it's been um, charged. Um, and difficult to just accept my body and, and love my body, you know, especially the femaleness, the essence of femaleness in the pelvis. So as I started to work with letting my center drop, letters, letting center and ground start to have a relationship with each other, ground I could get, that's feet, that's like four horse hooves. I could get that, but my center was up high. So how could I let my center drop down into the nether regions? Oh, scary, scary. And breathe down into there, breathe down into um, sexuality. Let's just say that word. And, and that harkens back to my father. You know, my father brought polio back from World War II. He was a robust athletic man but I never knew him that way because by the time I was born, he was already disabled. He never picked me up. He never threw me around. I'm sure he swatted me, um, but I didn't have a physical relationship with my father. And when I got onto the mat, I remember this at TAM, because I, I was like scared of being, I'd been in a relationship that fell apart I was scared of being in a relationship. I remember the joy, absolute joy of grappling with big, strong men and throwing them down. I was overjoyed. That was like, <laughs> fed me something that I, I, I missed. I, I didn't get that part. And big Amazon women too. And then, and then being able to handle it as an uke too. It fed me in a way that karate didn't even touch, you know, that, the, that level of physicality. It was a healing. Well, speaking, I don't know where you're going with that. Yeah, well, oh, so, so, so speaking. Oh, well, with men physically yeah. on the mat without anything having to do with sex. Oh my God, what a breakthrough that was for me. Mm -mm. Okay, it, so yeah. then. Then I could drop down into my seat of power and, and not have it have anything to do with sexuality because that felt still really crazy, scary to me. Mm. That's good. Well, that, so, now, now so I'm gonna kind of segue that to, yeah. to um, the body, somatics, yeah? Um, you talk a lot about that in your book, which I really appreciate, which is um, 
kind of the mind body split, right? And um, I'm going to read a quote for everybody uh, that the, the mind body split, which you kind of go into the history of and really talk about how that affects our whole society. At the very least, it teaches us to distrust, ignore, or override the innate wisdom of our bodies, including gut feelings, natural desires, and the secret language of the heart. Access denied to the creativity and sensuality that come from body-based intelligence, body shame, self-hatred, deep-rooted confusion about sexuality, and unconscious alienation from the body. So I'd love if you talk a little bit more about the body, somatics, mind-body split. Um, Lomi School certainly was our introduction to body work. We got really intensive hands-on training in deep body work, but along with uh, psychology, it's like you couldn't work on the body without the feelings and the psyche coming up, right? And through, you can't separate mind, body, spirit. Um, so yeah, if you talk about that, I love your thoughts on it. I think that's, I don't know if we can rate the importance of, of lessons generated from Aikido. I, I guess I'm gonna attempt to, but, but I think that mind-body unification is, is gotta be right up there at the top, number one. Um, and I didn't, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't have very many teachers who actually talked about it as such. We kind of went on to grounding and centering and extension and blending and entering and all that stuff. But I, I feel like I had to roll it back for myself um, to what, what's underneath that, what underlies that, is that you have to be in your body. What a concept, oh huh? <laughs> what a <laughs> concept. <laughs> what a and concept to be in your body. <laughs> and then be in your you body. Have to, you have to practice being in your body. And especially in the context of this culture, which from my point of view is getting further and further disembodied, if I can make up that word. Further and further. We, we look at screens, we put people, that, you know, when I worked on campus, I would see all my students, right, fondling their things, right? Heads down, walking into stuff, not hearing, not seeing, not feeling, not sensing. And the devil in me would want to come up and like goose them or something and go, hi, get back in your body. <laughs> goose them, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's dangerous. I think it's dangerous to have masses of people not in touch with their body, with their individual bodies, much less anybody else's body, much less the earth's body. Look at what's happening. We can barely register what we're doing. And it, to me, it all falls in a line. Yeah. So how do I, how, you know, what's the best thing I can do for climate change? You know, besides some practical stuff, I can stay in touch with my body, right? And the bodies of the people that I love and be open to loving other people that I haven't even met yet and be open to loving my horse and trees and dirt and worms. And you, you see how it extends out from there. It's Absolutely, I mean, I think that, that would be a great, a, a great topic actually uh, for you know, the whole session, which is how being embodied and, and through Aikido that we can be in touch with, um, you know, and, and what that would do to Mother Earth, our relationship with nature, Mother Earth, uh, the environmental crisis, uh, violence hurting other people's bodies because we absolutely, hurt our, yeah. absolutely, and 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 just a little caveat: being in the body that you've got, not some other made-up ideal, quote unquote, normal. Uh, then not that body. No, the one you've got. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for the self-love for our own bodies. Thank you for normalizing not normalcy. Um, yeah, real, no kidding. It helps me. It, after all this time, it still helps me because I'm so not normal, you know, um, and it's been a struggle. Who is? Raise, um, your, I, hand. Raise your hand if you're normal. <laughs> okay, then. I've heard, that right. normal, I've heard that normal is just a setting on a washing machine. There you go. <laughs> 
the ultimate <laughs> irony that the uh, Gay and Lesbian Center in San Diego is in normal in a neighborhood that's literally called Normal Heights on Normal Street in San Diego, <laughs> <laughs> which is totally great. <laughs> that's a true factoid. <laughs> Kathy, I'm going to switch gears because um, I'm thinking about time. Um, uh, so I know that you, when you left the Bay Area, you moved to the desert with your uh, mentor, Shihan, really, sculptor teacher, uh, mentor. And you had an incredible apprenticeship in the desert uh, working with, with your, your um, sculpting, sculpt, sculpture teacher. Could you talk, tell us, share us, uh, with us some about that time? Yeah. And I, I, did I just drop out? I, I think I pushed no, them you're off. here. You're here. Okay. I can't see anybody anymore. So I'm not sure what happened. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, again, it, it's, it's, I get to go in too fast. Um, to me, it's important to stop training now and then. Mm. To do that consciously. To stop training and go be, do, whatever, somewhere else. And for me, that was stone sculpture. And um, no, it, and, and it also got me into that idea of what, what's the ultimate point of training on the mat? I think it's about taking it off the mat. That's the point, taking it off the mat, into the world, into your life, into your family, into your job, that's the point. So circumstances and then later my own conscious decision, I would take several, I have taken several, I don't know the plural of hiatus. Who I don't know that. Anyway, several of them. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them was to the desert where all I did was carve stone. And I also practiced saying no um, because like many other women, I was not clear on yes and no. I was not clear. I was saying yes when I meant no. I was saying no when I meant yes. I'm, I don't think I'm the only one who's been confused about that. So I learned how to say no so that I could say yes more to myself. And I, and I was, you know, chipping stone and, um, living in a town of about 40 people way out and learning to conserve water and appreciate um, wilderness and, and living out on the fringe. Anyway, cut the story short, I came back to train some more and people went, oh my God, where have you been training? And I said, I haven't been, I've been carving stone. And they'd, they'd say, yeah, but you're, you're, you're such a thick, grounded uke. I was like, thick? Is that, are we, is that a compliment or is that, what is that? <laughs> it, and people would want to train with me because there was something I was bringing to the practice that, that I found in the desert. I, I still don't quite understand that, but it. Um, well, it's kind of like, how did your, did your Aikido inform your, your art? you know, your art training, artwork, oh, and, yeah. and back the other way, how does your uh, artwork uh, inform your Aikido? Way Street, absolutely. Spirals and, you know, and the basic shapes, the square, the circle, the triangle, the spirals. Oh, well, talk about that. I love all the things you have to say about circle, square, triangle. I'm just fascinated by how those concepts come up in our, in our language. Squaring up to a task. Um, standing up for your rights. You know, I mean, you just think about just phrases in English and, and, and um, that, that have to do with, um, with the square, you know, with being solid, right? And the circle, you know, move with it, blend with it, um, let it roll off of you, um, flow around it. But, you know, it's very watery, whereas the square is very earthy, very earthy. Um, triangle feels more like fire to me, um, making a point, taking a risk. Um, it's kind of the sword to my. Yeah, 
Yeah, maybe even blunt, maybe speaking your truth, maybe even a blunt way in a confrontation kind of a way. Um, anyway, those shapes are integral to sculpture for sure. And to, and to painting too, you know, and, and to how we decide who we're gonna be friends with. You need to know that your friends are solid, right? You need to know your friends are gonna forgive you and roll with crazy shit. <laughs> and you need to be able to speak your truth mm -hmm. and have someone hear it and embrace it, right? So the, they're, they're the three shapes again. I just find them really useful to think about. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna switch gears again. I'm gonna go back to, uh, now we're going, uh, not in chronological order, we're gonna go back to 1989 when we went to Russia. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just talk about that a little bit because I know that was a really impactful experience. We had, we had amazing times, we had a good time, but it was a very powerful, impactful time. Well, that was when Gorbachev was practicing, introducing Glasnost, taking a big risk, putting his sword way out there, <laughs> way yeah. out there. And um, when you and I and the people who traveled with us, Jamie, were making an end round, um, an end run using the circle to go around government stalemate, right and be and declaring ourselves citizen diplomats that a person-to-person -person connection can do a lot you know even when governments are entrenched so there's so there's the circle again and we made those connections extension being the triangle connection we made personal connections we trained on the mat we threw each other around <laughs> We couldn't speak each other's language, but we spoke the the language of Aikido. Yeah, and there there was there was love. Mm. There was yeah, there was. It was hilarious. <laughs> some yeah. some of it was hilarious. I remember people. them taking us to uh, Red Square, and we're all like touristing, right? And they're behind us with their joes and doing Aikido and going, excuse us, you could, they just, they wanted to learn Aikido. And it was like all this enemy stuff fell away so fast. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, finding a common language through, you know, sweating on the mat together, drinking at that table that fell down. And we all started <laughs> drinking, she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes. It's the only song we all knew. <laughs> Yeah. Commonality, great. right? The, the yeah, key, the key, the commonality. Stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great great. Stuff. <laughs> um, well, before we get to sensiglioblastoma, which we're getting there, um, could you share with us a little bit more about, you know, were you always a horsewoman? Um, in your book, you write so just beautifully about, uh, especially Esperanza, your, you know, your main horse, but I know you've had more, but uh, just the relationship with, with her. And uh, I'm going to read just another quote. In her presence, my breathing slows and deepens. When I'm astride her, my balance becomes more dynamic, attentive to each small shift, the base of my spine welded to the middle of hers. Watching Esperanza's vigilant ears swiveling around to catch each sound, my own hearing becomes acute and, and on. Um, such beautiful writing, but um, so I really recommend uh, that book and your other books. But um, if you would talk a little bit more about Kind of the, you know, Ike equestrianism. Horses are great ukes. Um, they are great mirrors. Um, historically, horses have, I don't know, well, if we go back mid-century um, into the cowboy kind of break the horse realm, mm. you can, it, they re reflect back to, to us as Americans that um, kind of that the dark, one of the darker sides that I will bend you to my will. You will do what I say. I don't know, I've had a couple senses like that. Um, thank God, not, not, not that often, but that kind of rough handling 
Um, does it work? You bet. Does the horse, does the UK want to stay in that dojo? Nope. So later in the, I don't know, I'm gonna say 80s, 90s and, and still, there's this movement towards what's known as natural horsemanship, partnership, more of a leader follower, melding back and forth flow of working with horses with how they really are. They're, they're prey creatures. They're not predators, we're predators. Although I think women can relate to being prey also. <laughs> Um, and, and men too, I'm sure. I can't just can't speak to that. Um, so that forcing a horse or forcing your uke to take the fall or to do whatever it is you want it to do, no doubt it's effective, but it, not in the long run because you're not building a partnership. You're not building trust. You're not building the desire to come back and play some more. Um, I when I feel like you have a question. I'm not sure when you get like this. Uh, it's just an observation, really. We keep coming back to so Russia, prisons, horses, etc. What you're doing is the language of principle, really, and you're showing that there's there's one language that works in every uh, place, and that is if you follow the principles, you get a very effective result. Exactly. And if you and if you use force in any of those other situations, especially in the prison, you get a result. But I'm not sure it's the one you want long range. And I think the, those principles and what you do, Kathy, is uh, healing. So there's healing that goes on in the prisons. There's a, a healing relationship with horses um, and actually. Uh, equestrian therapy is is a big thing right and uh yep. and it's also you know being centered and being connected and becoming one and sensing and feeling and not just being in your head and in your heart and treating the horse not like and, a body that you can just whip and take me somewhere right this and is a whole being it's about embodied practice too because horses are being prey animals they're very sensitive they're very skilled body readers and so if you're Mm -hmm. approaching a horse with e top heavy with a lot of ego mm -hmm. um, and and a lot of bullshit a horse will pick that up so fast it just will make your head spin but if you come at a horse genuine even if you're afraid even if you're afraid if you come at the horse generally genuinely connected to who you are in that moment the horse will give you a chance. So we're back to because, energetics because, and authenticity. Yeah, body because language. You're, you're lined up. You're, you're not trying to be who you're not. That's what a horse looks for. Be who you are. Mm -hmm. I think you're the greatest advocate for authenticity that I know. And, and that is about our alignment. And that is hopefully what we get from training. Yeah. Right. Um, but that's but, when we but, don't just fall into a system and have to obey and even take abuse ourselves right. in certain ways. Yeah. Right. And that happens in working with the, with me, it's mostly men in prisons who, you know, are wounded. I mean, in so many ways, but they come across my desk because I'm teaching English and they're all wounded in, in English. Some English teacher hit them hard and forced them and ruined their relationship with, with expressing themselves through the spoken or written word. And, and so that's, I try to heal that and get them to write about something authentic about themselves. And, um, and as soon as I do that and treat it with dignity, then we're connected. We're connected. So really they'll take a lot of risks after that once we're connected. Mm -hmm. So these are, you know, when we talk about principles or um, essentials, really, of Aikido, we think about centering and balance, et cetera. Those, I call them mechanics, in a sense, for the magic. But the real magic of Aikido um, is, is healing and being a healer, in a sense. And that would be in every part of our lives. 
which is going to be a segue right now to <laughs> it's now July 2019. Um, yeah. And one day your left hand starts doing weird things, as I recall. And the next thing you know, you're told you have a brain tumor. Well, and, I, well, don't forget the seizures. They were really fun. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it was a, what, like three weeks? So, I mean, from three no, weeks. To, no, uh, no, no, it's it a short amount then? of time. Even, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I so it was, don't know. It was quite got... unexpected. And yeah. well, what I wanted, I just want to say, I remember you. Um, letting me know the and calling me I think I was in Jerusalem I called you um it, like the day before you were going into brain surgery and what I remember so well is and what I want to ask you about is how you squared up to that it was like tomorrow I remember tomorrow I might die knowing very clearly square wide-eyed even with an eye like this completely wide eye right I could die tomorrow. I could come out, who knows what kind of impairment or even in a, uh, you know, say a, a vegetal, vegetative state, or maybe I'll be okay, who knows, but that's what you were facing. And yep. it was like warrior woman, but, but not battle woman, but just, I mean, I wanna know how you squared up to that. And, and then I remember the day after, you sounded the day after, like you sounded the day before. I don't know how you did that. Jenna's just done that herself from la a week ago, had a second surgery. It's like, and the next day, I don't know how you did that. Um, and I was blown away and it's now 20 months, which you've already outlived the prognosis. Um, so share with us about that. Well, did you I don't know if anyone else has had to sign the kind of release forms, Jenna, you and I have had to sign before having a craniotomy, but they are chilling. <laughs> <laughs> they are chilling. And then, and you say, yeah, okay, Molly's, Molly's nodding her head too. Um, anyway, I, I kind of wrote and walked my way through it. I, I, the nurses figured out pretty soon that I, I needed to walk. So they'd come and walk me. And that helped a lot. And then I'd sit at my laptop and um, try to write my way through it. So have a piece I can read if you want. Absolutely. Yep. So this was, uh, I think, right before the craniotomy called glioblastoma cancer blues pie. An atoll in my right parietal lobe, a dark lagoon surrounded by a necrotic reef, ever pushing outward, hungry for nourishment, contained by the wall of my skull. An indigenous tumor, this, not an immigrant from some other place. What is its origin? An errant thought? A pocket of hatred? In search of its genesis, I could blame myself for a million reasons, but that seems like a colossal waste of time. A fluke? A bit of wayward star stuff? That, of course, is exactly what we all are at any time, any place we probe. I used to think that the crazed and non-discriminating growth of cancer had to be attributable to repressed and thwarted creativity, an insane and blind reaction to the body's need to express itself, even at its own peril. But my life has been and continues to be a tribute to creativity, so I must kiss that theory goodbye and sit with an unanswerable question Glioblastoma is now part of my path. An unbidden sensei, formidable, mysterious, surprising. Line a pie plate with a stiff, heavy crust. Fill with blackberries and bittersweet chocolate chips. Mash until it bleeds. Then stir until the center is smooth and calm a dark lagoon. 
whip stitch the crust in a long tight seam and bake in a hot oven until the steam whistles and the juice drips. Eat without utensils, head first, so the pie is salted with tears. A couple days later, I started to write this piece. This is called, Welcome to Your New Sensei. <laughs> Number one, wrap a black belt around your suffering, your disease, your pain. Acknowledge that it is formidable, not something to be trifled with, ignored, or denied. See it as a sensei, a teacher, not an opponent or something to avoid or wall off. Open to the reality that it brings something you can learn and grow from, something that might help you come to terms with what is unresolved in your life, something that might help you connect with other people, something that might touch your heart and inspire your spirit. Two, bow in and accept the challenge, all of them. Square up to your new reality, stand your ground, walk your line, ask for support, listen to and obey your body. Check your vital signs often. Am I breathing? Can I feel my feet? Can I feel my back? Am I blanking out anywhere? Pay attention to your intuition, dreams, and body messages. Three, use a gentle sword to find clarity and set boundaries. Clearly ask for what you want and need, especially if you have a history of being fuzzy. Practice the most difficult phrases. I don't want to talk about this right now. I need for you to leave. I'm going home now. Be gentle with yourself. Telling the truth can be a very sharp sword. Consciously choose when, how, and to whom you make yourself accessible. Sometimes you have to walk away from negativity, fear, paranoia, ungrounded energy. Sometimes you even have to fire a doctor. Consciously choose what you put into your body. Consciously choose how you want to spend your time especially if your disease is terminal. Decide what you want done with your possessions in your body. Write your desires down, whether in a will or a letter. It will be a godsend to whomever you leave behind. Four, return to grazing. Maintain equilibrium. When you get knocked off center, and you will, Simply return to center as soon as you can. When you fall down, and you will, simply get up and dust yourself off. When you melt down, and you will, if there's something, oops, my pages, call a friend who's been there before. See these episodes without judgment, just great practice. Like horses, simply return to grazing when the hubbub is over. Five, enter into the problem. Use your sword to see into the heart of every problem, every challenge. Deal with the ones you must, let the other ones go. Enter into pain and suffering. Use it, transform it into expression. Pain is a message from the body. If you kill the messenger by smothering the pain, you won't get the message. The body might feel it has no choice but to amplify the message in order to be heard. Practice entering into the problem so that when your time comes to enter into dying, you will be ready. Use the reality, number six, use the reality of your suffering to open your heart and connect with a much more encompassing universe. Practice nonviolent communication. Make amends to the people you have shut out or refuse to forgive. Forgive those who have shut you out and refuse to forgive you. 
Practice forgiveness, even if it is in silence within your own heart. It will not only be a great gift to them, it is the best antidote to your disease. Forgive yourself for getting sick, for suffering, for dying. It's not your fault. You didn't do anything wrong. Besides, we all have to die sooner or later. Use your gentle sword to see into and connect with the heart of everyone you meet. See especially into the hearts of those who are taking care of you. Let them help you. Help them loosen their masks now and then. Help them express their own pain, fear, anger, and grief. Seven, quit holding back. What if you had a year to live, a month, a day? What would you keep doing? What would you stop doing? What would you change? Give your gift, the one only you can give, the one you are still here on this planet to give. If there's something you've always wanted to do, do it. Give stuff away while you can still enjoy giving. Practice letting go. Practice loosening your grip. Practice gratitude. There are a couple more, but yeah. I just want to say, oh, sensei. <laughs> really, <laughs> what, a, what a, a manifesto, really, for all of us. Can't wait till you publish all of that. And we yeah. have that to listen to again. I, I need to listen to it, you know, 10, 20, 50 times, really. Me too. Um, I do too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, before we open it up for people that um, ask questions and share, which I'm sure they want to, um, I wonder if you would uh it's hard to talk after all that thank you um but um i wonder if you could share two things one is there are two conversations i'd like you to share one is uh your conversation with dr doom the doctor that i fired yeah the doctor you fired because i think it's so important uh, and it was uh, uh, very it was so strong so you you were totally in your in your gian hakama i know that I had a delayed reaction, to be honest. Um, yeah, I let a doctor silence me um, in the way that I don't want to admit. You know, it, there's an intimidation factor, and he knew how to play it, and I knew it was happening, but I, I had kind of floated out of myself like a frozen deer and it took me a well, week well yeah but to it be took fair, me a week you were dealing with that. you know a sudden brain tumor and like yeah. many of us who practice aikido kind of more in the holistic bent not into you know regular um you know allopathic medicine and here you've got a brain tumor what do you do and and, and how all, do you do all that? that's true all that's true um and it, and i don't know if there are any doctors who are listening right now but it's a powerful position that they wield. Some of them wield it well, some of them not so much. And um, this doctor was definitely old school. And um, as I read him now, uh, kind of rerunning the movie in my head, I think he was bitter and depressed and despairing. I mean, glioblastoma is really bad. It's I really had, bad. One of my best friends died of it from within six to eight months of being diagnosed in 2005. Yep. yep. And, and so the best prognosis he could give, if, you know, I promised to be a good girl, which is hard for me to do. Maybe you're catching on to that. <laughs> um, I, I'm not a real big fan of allopathic medicine. Um, and he, he, he said, you know, craniotomy, six weeks of radiation, years and years of chemo and anything else we tell you to do. And you, and you might have 18 months, you might. Um, anyway, he got in my face, he wagged his finger at me, he backed me up. Um, I, 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 I couldn't even breathe. 
And um, it took me a week to kind of rerun that and go, wow, he, that's not okay. So I fired him and I wrote him a letter and I wrote several drafts of the letter until I was satisfied that I had found nonviolent language. And I asked him, please, to hear my feedback that I was not going to come back to him anymore, but would he please apply it to whoever else came into his room for a consultation? Always and the that, activist. Yeah, and then, and then I suggested that he go fishing. Hmm. Anyway, I, I, I think that many, um, many in the cancer club have had to go through that experience of, of um, having the guts to fire a doctor. That's, there's, there's an example of combination square and triangle, but it, but it took a while for me to catch it. Yeah. Well, and you've survived already, more than survived, thrived or continuing to thrive. It's 20 months, so you already outlived the 18 that was gonna have a quality of life that was frightful, right? Um, it, it, so you're doing some of the allopathic, right? You have what, every three weeks chemo. And at the same time, you're living on the land with your horses, with Henry, you've been doing all the art and uh, Aiki and breath practices. So, you know, um, what do you think's really, really helping you so much? And is there, is there a blend of, of sort of regular and uh, alternative, which I hope it won't be called alternative anymore. Just, you know, there, 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 has, too. There, there, there has to be a blend. Mm -hmm. For me, there's no choice. There has to be a blend. And I, I found a doctor who's okay with there, that being a blend. He, it's not his world, but he knows that I'm doing other stuff in addition to everything he tells me to do. This is a new doctor. He knows that I'm taking turkey tail mushroom extract. He, he knows that I'm doing shamanic healing. He knows that I'm being an artist. He knows I'm praying. I have a lot of people praying for me. I'm not a real religious person. So I mean prayer in the good vibe, hippie good vibe kind of sense of the word. Um, and, and so what he said to me last time, and last scan I had, which is in January, it was clear. Nothing in there that's not supposed to be in there. Nothing but my brain. And wow. that's unheard wow. of. He wow. was skipped into the room. He was like, oh, my God. Of course, he said, oh, the Avastin must be working. But then he caught himself. He says, and keep doing whatever else you're doing, too. So that's wow. the doctor for me. You're not going to get a better doctor than that. Wow. it's awesome. OK, number two that I wanted to ask you. Uh, the other conversation, and it's your conversation with sensei glioblastoma. Oh. Okay, which, I have, I have yeah, that. Yeah, you can read about that, but I also want you to talk, but just before you read, would you talk about saying to sensei, if I die, you won't have a student, that's, so you won't be a sensei anymore. <laughs> that's that's what's in here, yeah. Oh, yeah, really? I wrote, that's great. Uh, yeah, I, I wrote a letter, Dear Sensei Glioblastoma, and this was about a, a year a year ago today, I learned of your existence in the right parietal lobe of my brain. You got my attention with that spooky seizure in the parking lot of Safeway. Later in the emergency room, I caught a glimpse of what you looked like in the CT scan. I remember thinking like an artist does, that there was a certain organic beauty in your form, like an aerial shot of a coral atoll. Later in the day when I was strapped on a gurney in the back of the ambulance on my way to Denver, we drove through a torrential rainstorm going over La Vida Pass. The ambulance lurched and jolted and shuddered and thumped its way up I-25 to Denver. All this peril was clear to me, but somehow removed. Miraculously, Henry arrived in the hospital about four hours behind me. For some reason, even though a lot of my memory has since thinned to threadbare. These de details are etched and inked. Sensei, I've been training with you for a year now. I see that you are fierce, demanding, and relentless. I see that taking ukemi from you means I have to be ready for anything, especially hard falls. That's okay. I expect it. 
I see that you are also a jealous teacher. Thank you for keeping Sensei coronavirus out of the dojo. I have more things to offer. Training with you has clarified many things in my life. How I want to fill up the time I have left or leave it empty. Who I want to hang out with. What I want to put into my artistic hopper and what I want to keep out. How important it is to have my hands in the dirt and on the stone and holding the brush. How important it is to touch Esperanza every day and hold Henry's hand at night and giggle in the morning. However, I need to respectfully point out to you that I have just passed a Q test, possibly a Don test, that you didn't schedule. And here's my evidence. I have kept my center and ground no matter what you have thrown at me. I've kept and even grown my sense of humor. That might be spelled G-R-O-N, I don't know. I've never borne any malice toward you. Unlike much of the language around cancer, I've never spoken about defeating you or kicking your ass, tempting as that may be. I've always tried to practice Aikido with you. I know that just like me, you are a bit of star stuff, simply trying to survive. Here's the last bit of evidence, the thing that has promoted me in rank. I know that if you kill me, you will also kill yourself. And I know you know that too. So I'm calling your bluff. I challenge you to join me in coming to some amiable, mutually respectful agreement so we both get to live. Doing so promotes me as your equal. Your student and colleague, Kathy San. Wow. Whoa, Kathy San. <laughs> Kathy San, Kathy Sensei. Thank you for so much sharing. Um, now you all know why I said I don't know whether I love her more dearly or respect her more deeply. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, incredible. And, you know, I mean, I had bike accident. It was like, you know, this compared. And I, the challenge is just incredible, yeah, and to bow into the pain and the difficulties and the disability and the unknowns and every other thing about it. So, um, wow, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I just wanna open it up for people if you have uh, comments, questions. Yeah, starting with Quentin Sensei. I was um, listening to one of the recordings from the Solstice seminars earlier on, Kathy, and uh, you said something like, wouldn't it be great if Aikido actually becomes useful in the world? Well, well, I think you might have proved that it has proved useful in your world and, and how it can be useful in ours. But my question is, when you started Aikido, did, you, did it feel like you'd found a long lost friend and did you see the potential in it from the beginning? I wouldn't have been able to articulate it then. Um, but on a body level, on an instinctual level, yes, I recognize Aikido. I, I started with karate. I got into the martial arts because I had an otherwise nice and peaceful boyfriend who started flicking punches and kicks off of my nose. I, and it infuriated me. And um, so my first motivation was revenge. <laughs> but it, I, my body didn't fit in karate at all and i and i didn't like the end goal or or my conception of the end goal as a younger person and when i saw aikido i went oh 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 absolutely i'm lower to the ground all of it was lower to the ground i love the fluid the ground the falling the getting up fall down get up one word um I just, I fell in love with it on that level. But I know Quentin and Jamie and maybe others of you too, Janice, I thought I saw you. Um, I know that the pandemic may have helped us discover Zoom and talking with each other and finding our community that way. But I know that those of you who are still running a hands-on dojo 
you're trying to figure out how to reach more people, right? Younger people, um, untapped communities. And I don't have an answer for that. I just have an answer for me. But I think it's got to be, I think it's got to be in this realm of understanding how incredibly useful it is in our lives and in the life. And if we're going to exist on the planet, we've got to do Aikido with climate change. I don't know what that looks like. I, I'm just seeing these things, but I can, I can almost see it and feel it. It's got to get way bigger. It can't just be your little neighborhood dojo. And in a way, I hope that, I don't know when to use when or if, so I'll just use them both. We get through this pandemic and the masks come down and the dojos open up. I hope we don't stop talking to each other. Mm. Well, yeah, we're already talking about how do we keep these things going and so many of the things that really have been the gifts of this weird time, right? Um, and hopefully more awareness of extending, I keep extending, yeah, and that yeah, we love all our ikios and nikios, but that's not really the end game, and that's not all there is. Anybody else? A question or comment? I don't really Joanna. know. Oh. Joe, Joe, come on in. Go, oh, Molly. No problem. I'll go after. Molly, then Joe. Joe and Molly. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I don't really have a question. I just have an honoring of the gift of Aikido in um, supporting life well done. And particularly when it comes to the things that challenge us that are totally unexpected and out of typical, you know. Um, personally, it has, has been, continues to be a vital force for me in just day to day, moment, moment by moment, you know, it's just like there. Um, it's rich and um, yeah, what can I say other than that? Well, and also I think helping us be prepared for when some huge challenge comes, like it came to you, Molly, like it's come um, through cancer. Um, mine was a mini huge challenge recently that I know I wouldn't have gotten through without, without my training. Yeah. Yeah. Joe? Yes. Um, hi, Kathy. Hi, everyone. Uh, well, everything was um, body blowing, mind blowing, heart blowing. Um, actually, uh, it's not actually a question, but more than a wish or a uh, an invitation. Um, I'm getting along here with women, Aikido women. Me and Jamie, we have been talking a lot uh, last year uh, about connecting our our biological bodies with our practice that it was mostly for men. And um, well, a lot of uh, researching, researching with myself, my experiences as a, how my body works as, as a woman's body, my instincts. Um, and I'm also getting involved with a project in Sao Paulo for women in prison and women that are getting out of prison and entering in the market again. So it's not only for the women, but also we, we also have to work with the companies that might hire them. And anyway, right in the beginning, uh, our country is a chaos with the pandemic. So we are just uh, working remotely on that, writing, developing the language the needs um so if if we could meet again in another day or if i could contact you for your support on that i would be very grateful for that to develop everything our our body communication it's kind of we are each one in one place uh in our houses we have this invisible sensei that uh, it's complicated everything a lot but on the other hand it's just bonding a lot of us so we are working on that. We are not just in the position that we can't do nothing. So uh, I'll be very glad if we can meet. No, oh, okay. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful work. Yeah, Aikido half houses. 
you know, they prisoners are not prepared mm -hmm. to come out into this world. Can you imagine being locked yeah. up for 20 years and then coming out tomorrow? Yeah. 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 No. So, so those yeah. kind of, you know, grounding, centering, I mean, it, that's the kind of population that I hope gets reached by high key extensions. Mm. Yes, definitely. Yeah, well, we have a lot of this yes, yes. and I'm looking forward for that. Excellent. Anybody else? Something to share or ask? I'm trying to type my um, email and, and website. Yeah, we'll get your website in there, Kath, don't worry. Dream, okay. Dream Power Artworks. Um, Susan, would you mind typing that in there? We'll, we'll do it, Kathy. I've got Dream a question. Power for, yeah, I, I, I've got a yeah. question for Jenna. Jenna, you've been listening to this as a non Aikidoist. I'm just wondering what you're making of it all. Well, it's interesting because what I've learned is when the doctor gives you um, a, a note that they've been working on for 12 years, you have to realize that they don't know what they're doing. And you have to realize, <laughs> right? I mean, they've been working on it for 15 years and you know, they're, they're not getting good, good reviews. And so they, you have to, with three, three minutes of a day, get ready to make a decision about what you're gonna do. And it's really impossible because you, know, you don't have the medical, um, and you don't have, you just don't have anything you need to get it ready. And everyone's telling you, oh, this is great. And this is great. And you know that what they're getting is your data and you don't get anything, you know? So, um, yeah, so I've had to learn myself how to figure out what to do with this. And I don't know whether I'm doing it right or not doing it right. I'm doing it as my as myself. And I have to, you know, these people said they can do it, but they need me to make it four times bigger. Well, I don't want to do that because mine, unfortunately, is on the left side. And so if I do it on the left, then I'm going to lose my um, preservation. So, um, I, I'm just doing it the way I can, and but I'm interested in the other, the other way, how to balance it out because they really don't know. And um, so I did the most recent thing, and I four days ago had surgery, and now I'm I'm fine until the next MRI. Well, Jenna, next, one thing exactly, exactly. That's where I am too. Right. And you're just waiting for the next thing and then you have to look at what is it that you need to do. Is there somebody well, I, out there doing that for us? I don't know. Something you've done, Jenna, well, two things. One is just what Kathy's been talking about or what we would put the words like uh, of being authentic, being centered. And you've also done what we call Irimi, which is to enter. So I happen to know Jenna very well, right? And a year ago when you were diagnosed, it was, this is an inoperable tumor. And you were just, <laughs> I'm gonna find the doctor who says it's operable. And you found the doctor who operated and got it. You weren't taking that for an answer and you just you know, were like this, talk about the triangle and the, <laughs> this. And then as uh, recently, as another small tumor has uh, reappeared and that was new information. And the doctor said, well, let's wait till it gets bigger because it's sort of easier to take out. And you were like, no, I want to take it out right now while it's little. And you went in for brain surgery, a second one last week and you're out, here you are. Um, right. So you have entered in, trusted yourself. And uh, you know, I, I think that that's, um, you know, that's keeping you very clear on your path and, and going. One other really cool thing I will say, um, Jenna's been finishing up a book and so I'm trying to um, work on that a little bit with her and uh, she had like one or two last stories to write and the language, the actual speaking and words get a little difficult, but the other side of her brain does her sign language. So she can, right Jenna, you can express better and find words through sign language than you can sometimes through verbal language. 
So it's right. like finding someone bilingual with sign language in English to be able to express what you want and finish writing. Yeah, and get but your you know, book done. The, the serious thing was I was two stories away and I had to get it done before I went to the hospital. And that's the thing is you have to figure out what is it like to go to the hospital and not know if you're gonna come out of them, you know? And you have to know who you want to leave the things to and who you want so that when you go in, it's it, there's clear because you don't know what they're gonna do. So. You know, it's interesting about the word practice, the practice of, you guys, I'm not Aikido, but I see the, passion and the practice in my sport in your in your passion and the medical field they don't call it practicing medicine for nothing and i think what you all have especially jenna and kathy have done is you're not interested in people practicing you're interested in people doing their doing their job and you working with them to help you get better. So practice. Mm. Kathy, now, just a quick I... comment. Pardon me. I, I gotta go. I'm, you're just as spicy as I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> just, just want to send you my love and, and uh, keep on keeping on, darling. Thank you, Chris. You too. You too. It's great to see you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Anything else? Anything else you want to share, Kathy? I was going to ask you if there's anything you that you want people to know about facing death or living life or bowing into it all. But I think you already did all that. Yeah, I, I think so. I think so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know. You've been to meltdowns, but um, but that that's fall down, get up. You know, you know yeah. make sure you have a good support system around you too. I just so I'm working on a book called Bowing Into Sente Glioblastoma and trying to get some help with the the uploading and the designing of it because that part I uh, my brain has about this much uh, attention span for that. Um, but it's, it'll be a self-published kind of a deal, probably through Big Bad Amazon, I'm sorry. Um, but that's convenient. And um, so be looking for it. And the other books, the Aikido Off the Mat book is up there. Uh, also through North Atlantic Books, yeah, which has many um, martial art titles. And um, if you buy it through North Atlantic, then I actually get uh, a royalty so, <laughs> so this, this is I whatever it is that. yeah and uh fabulous book i'm gonna read one last quote before we finish from it and um kathy would you what are your other books because they're they're just beautiful as well there's i wrote a memoir about working with my sculpture teacher called seeing into stone a sculptor's journey and um i lived in a tiny little desert town um and um, learned how to carve marble, which I still do. And so if you look at the website, somebody put that up there. There's some wood and stone sculptures and a lot of paintings and um, yeah, talk about a grounding practice, carving stone, woo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and then I also wrote a compilation book called Coyote Points the Way uh, borderland stories and plays, um, stories about living here in the San Luis Valley of Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can see you're as much an artist with words as you are in, in your paintings and drawings and sculptures. Um, I suggest friending Kathy on Facebook because you get to see, she posts a lot of, um, this, you know, pictures and, and of her work. And I think some of it's available. <laughs> Uh, for yep. sale. Is that true? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I want to ask you one more thing. How did you find such a perfect uh, partner? Mm -hmm. 
And what's it like having a partner who does art and does Aikido and does all these things with you? And he, and he was such a beautiful guy. Well, in a weird way, it involves prisons again. Um, not that either of us have lived in a prison, but Henry had a friend who I met in the dojo at Hiroshi Ikeda Sensei's dojo up in Boulder, um, whose husband was serving time in Walla Walla, Washington. And she was trying to create a, um, a venue for prisoners to make art and send it out and sell it so that they actually had some money to put into the commissary. And my friend, the mutual friend, Linda, knew Henry. And I knew Linda on the mat because we were throwing each other around. Right? And in Ikeda Sensei's dojo at that time, we're talking throwing, yeah. Um, anyway, she saw that, she knew that I was an artist and the mutual friend and she knew Henry was an artist and she said, huh, you, you guys should meet each other. You're both artists. Anyway, that's how it happened. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that was one of those two where I, the only part that was confusing to me was Henry at the time was living in a household of all men and he was painting feathers and butterflies and flowers and stuff. And I went, I, I had been asking the universe, please, I'm ready to meet my mate. And so my first reaction was like, oh God, do I have to be specific that I want to meet, you know, a, a man who's interested in being with a woman? Come on, God. Anyway, but we got through that. <laughs> your your partnership and through through it all is really quite quite incredible. Yeah. So lots of love and to he, Henry. He he yeah. he watched for a long time. For 10 years he watched Aikido, me teaching mm -hmm. Aikido. And then one day he stepped onto the mat. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well, so I'm gonna read this last quote. Um uh, Kathy honored me by asking me to write forward for a book and uh so her book, uh, Aikido Off the Mat, is just so rich. You are going to love it. And she storytells a lot. And she has so many great perspectives on, um, uh, well, on society, on a more centered economy, on language, uh, so many things. So um, I said, as Kathy Sensei storytells from on and off the mat, we are walked into considering how things are inside our own bodies and minds on the planet and in our challenging lives and struggling societies. So there is a real message um, and, and for every aspect of our lives and, uh, and every, every moment that we're, we're facing every day and that we're, we embrace <laughs> that we are gifted with every single day. So I just wanna thank you so much, Kathy, for being, being new <laughs> and for sharing so much and taking this time. Anybody else? Just a little love for Kathy. A lot of love. Yeah. Just a final <laughs> comment from me, which is that uh, you said at some point that you're careful about what you choose spending your time with now. So thank you for spending it with us. Mm -hmm. You are most welcome. This was a good choice. Yeah. And the power nap is around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> and the recording will be there because there is so yeah. much here. And what you read, I think we could all, uh, and I'm in the chat, is like, I need to hear that again. So... Uh, again and again. Thank you so much. Uh, a, a lot of it is on my blog, which is on the website. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. if you go to the part that says Kathy and go down to musings, you'll see um, mm -hmm. a lot of the book in progress is already up there on the internet. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Quentin. Sensei for her. Big hug. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Really. Take, take care, Jenna. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I hope you keep getting good news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, let's keep in touch. Yeah, that'd be great. Jamie will set us up, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, so much. Well done, everyone. Thanks. Bye bye. Mm -hmm. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. bye. Thank you, bye. Kathy. Thank you, Quentin, Jamie. Bye, everyone. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Big love. Mm. <laughs> See you all later. <laughs> I'm going to close the room now. Hang with the ground. Okay, KP, you're amazing. Thank you.